Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 18 of Introductory Linear Algebra. In today's class we're going to prove a claim that I made in the previous video. I claimed that every linear system out there has either no solutions, or exactly one solution, or infinitely many solutions. And I said that those were the only three possibilities. So we're going to prove that fact in this video. And the key to being able to prove that fact and other nice facts about linear systems is the ability to rewrite linear systems as matrix equations. Okay, so that's our first step. I'm going to show how you can rewrite any linear system in terms of matrices, just to sort of simplify them and make them easier to work with and talk about. Okay, so here's the setup. Suppose that you've got some system of linear equations. Okay, so the first equation we can write in this form here, x1, x2, up to xn, those are the variables in the linear system. And then I'm just giving names to the coefficients in the linear system as well. So the first scalar, the first coefficient is a11, and then a12, all the way up to a1n. Okay, and I mean the first subscript here, I'm just using that to denote which equation I'm in. And then the second subscript sort of denotes which variable it's multiplying by, okay? And then B1 is going to be the right-hand side for the first equation, okay? It's the first, con it's the constant on the right-hand side of equation one. Okay, and then equation two, it'll have a very similar form, except all of the first subscripts just go up by one, right? Because I'm using the first subscript to tell me which equation I'm in. But it's got the same variables, okay? So the second equation has the same variables as the first equation. Okay, but maybe different coefficients. So now I'm going to call them a21, a22, all the way up to a2n, and the right-hand side this time is b2 instead of b1. Okay, and every single equation looks like this all the way up to the mth equation. Okay, but again, same variables in each of them, okay, but possibly different coefficients. So am1, am2, all the way up to amn this time, and the right-hand side is bm. Okay, so this is the general form of what a linear, a linear system looks like, a system of linear equations. Okay, well, the thing to realize here is that this ugly linear system, you can write it much more compactly as a certain matrix multiplication, okay? The way that you can rewrite this compactly is you can write this as AX equals B, okay? Where A is some matrix, X is some column vector, and B is some column vector, okay? And all of these, they're sort of indexed in the obvious way, okay? What is A? Well, A, that's just the matrix that you get if you take all of these coefficients, all of these little a's, and throw them into a matrix sort of in the order that you see them there. Okay, so I stick A11 in the top left corner, A12 in the next entry over to the right, and so on. Okay, you just index them row column like we always do with matrix entries. Okay, first subscript tells you the, tells you the row, second subscript tells you the column, just like always with matrices. Okay. And then x, that's a column vector that just has the little x's in it, okay, the variables. And then similarly b, that's a column vector that has the right-hand sides. These are constants, these are given numbers, b1 up to bm. Okay, and if you work out what happens when you do a times x, right, when you multiply these things together, well, in the top row of that product, you're going to get all of these dotted with these, in other words, you're going to get exactly this quantity up here, this a11 times x1 plus a12 times x2 and so on. Whereas on the right-hand side, the top entry is going to be b1. Okay, so if you actually do this matrix multiplication here, you're going to see that you get, you know, a vector with n entries on the left and a vector with n entries on the right, and the entries just match up here, right? That the top entry on the left will be this, the top entry on the right will be this. The second entry on the left will be this, the second entry on the right will be that. Okay, so equality of these two vectors is equivalent to equality of the n equations that we had up here because the n equations there, they're basically the entries of those vectors. All right, so let's do a quick example just to make sure that we understand this a little bit more concretely. Let's return to a linear system that we saw in the previous lecture. We saw this two by two linear system, this linear system with two equations uh, and two unknowns, two variables. Okay, well, you can rewrite this as a matrix equation, right, in this form ax equals b. Okay, and the way you do that is you just take the coefficients, one minus two, three minus two, stick them into a matrix. Okay, and then take the right-hand side numbers, negative two and six, stick those into a column on the right-hand side, and then your variables, x and y, stick those in a column here, okay? So this is the matrix A, this is the vector x, and this is the vector B, okay? And this linear system is satisfied if and only if this matrix equation is satisfied. They're equivalent to each other. And the way you see that is just imagine multiplying this out on the left here. Okay, if you, if you were to do this matrix vector multiplication, you would get 1 times x minus 2 times y. In other words, you'd get exactly x minus 2y, and that's got to equal the top entry on the right, that's got to equal minus 2. 
And then on the bottom, you'd get 3x minus 2y equals 6. Oh, well, that's what we said down here. 3x minus 2y equals 6. So they're equivalent to each other. Okay? It's just a much more compact and convenient way of writing it down because we know all sorts of things about matrices, right? We, we spent a lot of time learning about matrices and all the nice properties they have. So now if we want to prove something about a linear system, well, just use the matrix things that we know to prove that thing about linear systems. All right, and to illustrate that idea, it's theorem time, okay? And this is the theorem that I said we were going to get to. Okay, so here's the fact that we sort of ex explained earlier, but now we're actually going to justify it. Every single linear system of equations that you've got, no matter what dimensionality, no matter how many equations, no matter how many variables, always one of things, three things happens. Always one of three things. Either there's no solutions, or there's exactly one solution, or there's infinitely many solutions. No other possibility. You're never going to get a linear system with exactly 73 solutions. It's just not possible. All right, so where does this come from? Well, it comes from these matrix ideas. All right, so let's prove this. All right, and the trick here is if you want to show that every linear system has zero or one or infinitely many solutions, you just have to show that if there's at least two solutions, then there's actually infinitely many, right? Because you're okay if there's zero solutions. You're okay if there's one solution. You just need to show that as soon as there's two solutions, there's actually infinitely many. So that's what we're going to do. Suppose that we've got two solutions, okay? And let's just call them x1 and x2. Okay, so what we mean by that, what's it mean for there to be two solutions? That means that a times x1 equals b. So like if I plug in the vector x1 as, you know, my vector of variables, if I plug in whatever values are in here, then the linear system is satisfied. a times x1 does equal b. It does equal the right-hand side that I want. And similarly, x2 is a solution. That means a times x2 equals the right-hand side I want. It equals b. Okay, and because they're two different solutions, I need x1 does not equal x2. All right, great. So that's the setup here. My goal now is to show that there are infinitely many solutions based on that. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show that, okay, if x1 is a solution and x2 is a solution, then I can sort of create many other solutions out of those two solutions. All right. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm just going to pick any old real number. It does not matter what it is, just some real number. And then construct this vector here, c times x1 plus 1 minus c times x2. And this maybe seems a little bit strange at first, but let's see what happens when I multiply this vector by a. I'm going to see that it's actually that this is a solution. In other words, I'm going to see that a times this vector equals b. All right, so how do I get there? Well, just use properties of matrix multiplication. Okay, a times this ugly vector here, well, by properties of matrix multiplication, I know I can split up all these brackets, right? Matrix multiplication, it distributes over vector addition, over matrix addition, but, you know, these are column vectors here, all right? And similarly, I can pull the scalars out in front, okay? So when I split this up and bring scalars out in front, I get c times ax1 plus 1 minus c times ax2. And now, remember that x1 and x2, those are solutions, so ax1 equals b. And similarly, ax2 equals b. So I can substitute b in for both of those vectors down there, and I get c times b plus 1 minus c times b. And then if you just expand that out and simplify as much as possible, right, I'm just going to get c plus 1 minus c all times b. So I'm just going to get one copy of b at the end of the day. The cb and minus cb cancel out with each other. I'm just left with b. Okay, so in other words, this vector here is also a solution of the system of linear equations. Okay, no matter what c is, like it did not matter what the value of the real number c was, so that tells us there's infinitely many solutions, right? Because there are infinitely many different choices that I can make for c. If I choose c equals 1, then I get x1, right? If I choose c equals 1, then I get uh, x1. I apologize, this plus sign here should be a minus sign. Then that would go away, and I just get x1. If I choose c equals... Uh, zero, then I get x2. But then for other values of c, I get vectors sort of between uh, x1 and x2, okay? Like if I pick c equals a half, then I get the average of x1 and x2. If I pick c equals seven, then I get, get a vector that's sort of a long distance in the direction of x1 and then minus some modification of x2, okay? But it's still a solution no matter what value of c I pick, any real number, okay? So there are infinitely many solutions. All right. And that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about today. So starting next class, we'll actually look at how to solve systems of linear equations. Now that we know that there's only three these three possibilities, how do we actually determine which one of them it is? How do we determine if there's no solution or one solution or infinitely many? And how do we find those solutions uh, if they exist? So that'll be next class. I'll see you then.